Hey guys, VBAD here with another V Plays, and today we're going to be taking out the Tier 9 British Chevy known as the P228, sporting four 30mm Aidens and an obscene amount of air to ground rockets, 16 to be precise. Now, I find this aircraft to be a little bit easier to use compared to the 262, and it's mostly due to the 30mm Aidens, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but for right now, I'm going to be F2ing the mine and then heading over to their, oops, to their command center. <laughs> oh, jeez. There we go. I am going to let loose with my air to ground ordinance here to try and help out the team a little bit. But we can also use our 30 millimeter Aidens to soften up some of these ground targets. Hopefully that'll help the bombers out by taking out that big structure. And I'm going to save the rest of my air to ground rockets as I burn away from this threat. And we're going to start looking for opportune targets, primarily something like what we see here. This human controlled aircraft and a light fighter. And he's pretty much gone. There's another one right here. It looks like he's going after ground targets. Interesting choice, sir. And then we'll throw a single one here. And there is the enemy 262. We're going to get guns on. Good hit indications. Got his engine. Managed to take him out. Burning away from this area. We're going to start heading up after this vampire. We're going to F for the target. I'm going to get a little bit more altitude here before I decide to engage him. So that way I can control that fight. And let's see what we can do here to pick him up while he's otherwise indisposed. Zooming in with the guns. Good hits. He lost his tail. We're going to go ahead and leave him to the enemy turn or the friendly turn fighters. So that way they can take him out. We did pick up this zone. Yes, vamp. I see that you're on my six, but I'm going to be able to power through. Couple of good hits on the dough there. We'll see if we can get around on him here. Hop into the gun sights. Some more good hits. Knocked him out. I see the human down here chasing our friendly aircraft. Again, into the gun sight. Knocking this guy out. I would like to go and help with this mine. Hopefully we can get there before the enemy picks it up. Our bomber's overhead as well, but no such luck. If you see a bomber and you're in a heavy and you're not being chased by something nastier than you are, you should be vectoring in for intercept and letting those guns fly and doing as much work as you possibly can to take out these very dangerous aircraft that can definitely hurt you in the long run because they'll be picking up zones while you're busy trying to kill aircraft. I see the multi-roll down low. <laughs> it is an F-84. He's more concerned about that defense aircraft than his own life. We're going to go after the IL-20 before he picks up some of the zone our allies have been working on. Letting these guns settle in and knocked him out, picked up the zone. And now we're going to F-2 the mine over here, get some of our altitude back, burn the boost cooler and head over towards the zone because there seems to be a multi-roll there and I would like to make him a non-factor for my ground attacker. There he is diving on my friendly. Looks like he's going to be turning back in. Try and get some cheeky shots off here as he straightens out. But unfortunately, he is powering right through us. Try to get around on him here. Slicing out of the sky a little bit. Got him. Picked up the zone. Used those air to ground rockets. And... Oop, wrong button. Bat fingers. We want to do that. And we're going to go after the bomber yet again. I do see that multi-roll that's kind of encroaching on my path. 
as well as this heavy aircraft. So we're going to go for the 262. Couple of cheeky shots off there. Now we're on the TU-10. He is burning. Now he's gone. There's the multi-roll. It's an F2G. He is up at a ridiculous altitude right now. We should be able to get on this target since his roll maneuver isn't quite going to be good enough in this instance. What do we got over here? I see a light fighter and a ground attacker or a, a multi-roll. That's the key. These guys are going to be trying to take out ground targets with a turn fighter. Interesting. Seahawks, probably the better target for me right now. Couple of good hits. A little bit of a crippling shot there. But I see a juicier target, and that's going to be the bomber. Oh, there's the light fighter still chasing me. Nope, that is a multi-roll. We'll get that engine back up. Keep burning up high. And what is this multi-roll? It is the Seahawk that we injured earlier. But now he's in a bad altitude position and we managed to take him out. There's the bomber again. It is going to be squall line in about 37 seconds. Managed to take that target out. But I do see that this heavy's vectored in on my yak. I'm going to try and give him a bit of a hand here. And that's match. Looks like we got a grade two as well as a McCampbell and a McGuire and winged legend. So we'll throw up the GG, head back to the hangar and talk a little bit more about this airframe. Uh, those guns I find are a lot easier to handle than the typical 262 guns, even at tier nine, uh, mostly because they actually have a, a hidden stat of a higher shell velocity. I can pull that up real quick for you before we get too far into it. But the Guns on the, the Aidens on this aircraft uh, have a shell velocity of 422 meters per second, while the 30 millimeters, uh, 30 millimeter cannons on the HG2 are only going to be 356. That's nearly 70 meters per second faster, which means that they're a little bit more forgiving for trying to pull lead on a target. That whole when in doubt, uh, aim further out. I think that's Postal's phrase, but it definitely helps out quite a bit. And then the added benefit is actually going to be the range of the guns, because if we go to the upgrade tree here, you're going to see that the Aidens can fire out to 2600, opposed to the 2297 that you get with the HG2. So 2300 versus 2600. But Bear in mind that the effective range is when you're getting the full damage potential out of these guns, you can still start getting hit indications at around 3,000 feet out, which means that with the 228, you can start doing ranging shots earlier instead of being kind of an all or nothing you get with the HG2. And for those of you that have been flying 262s, you know that those guns can be a little bit difficult to shoot at aircraft that are pulling um across your field of view so uh, you're departing across your line of sight so being able to range these guns and kind of plan your attack and make sure that you're on target before you hammer down with the trigger makes these a little bit easier to use the damage per second is only 330 opposed to 350 with the hg2 but in all honesty if you can get these guns to hit more consistently the dpm isn't as much of an issue unless you're going up against bombers or ground attackers, but even still, the P228 does fairly well for itself. And as you can see here, we did manage to take out three bombers, a ground attacker, two heavies, four multi-rolls, and three light fighters. I don't think we killed a single defense aircraft. We got a decent amount of capture points, and 
only 80 while defending. So we made our way across the map, help capture the mine, help capture that command center. Uh, and then we also helped recapture the mine after we lost it on that initial run in. So I like the P228. I think it's a lot of fun. I think it's a nice change of pace compared to the 1056 because you're getting consistency with those 30 millimeter cannons opposed to the 420s and the 240s you got on the P1056. Don't get me wrong, I like the 1056, but this feels like it's more consistent when those guns start hitting instead of trying to line up two different calibers of gun with different shell velocities and different ranges. The air to ground rockets. Don't get me wrong, we did a pretty good job in that last battle had taken out a few ground targets. Uh, we took out two of the small ground targets while we were there. We assisted with taking out several others. Uh, so we did pretty decent there. I have used these in clutch uh, when we were going after a mine. The enemy bombed most of the center site and I was able to launch a couple of rockets and finish it off. They have their opportunities, but in order to use them, you have to dive down low. You have to remain on target for a decent amount of time before you let loose with these things. So if you've got enemy, any enemies around, you're going to have to climb back up to altitude to get your advantage back. And that takes time. It takes boost. And frankly, it can be quite a hindrance to what your primary role is, which is to be a bunch of big guns to take out bombers and ground attackers and unaware light fighters that went up too high. So that's where this aircraft really shines. Uh, I've struggled going up against tier 10s, but let's be honest, tier 10 pilots tend to be specialized. So we struggle against things like the XF-90, but that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. What do I have this thing fitted out with? I have gone with the gun sight, I've gone with the turbine, and I've gone with the reinforced bolt carriers. This also allows you to be able to hammer down in that trigger a little bit more. When you're getting those ranging shots, you start to heat up the gun, and then once you lock in, you hammer down on the trigger, and that gives you a little bit more forgiveness as you're closing on a target, and you want to ensure that you get that kill. I do like that you get two engine consumables right from the get-go before you specialize, because I have lost my engine periodically and losing your engine can be a death sentence in an aircraft that requires its speed to survive. And obviously a boost cooler because you know me in boost coolers. I think it's nice to have that energy available in the piggy bank. Um, we're currently going with a fairly benign setup, Engine Guru and Marksman 1. That's pretty much where I'm at right now with this aircraft. I do think in a lot of ways... This is just an easier to use 262 and these 30 millimeter Aidens, you better get used to them now because if you're going down any of the British lines and you're hoping to get to tier 10, the 228 gets these, the Javelin gets these, the Hawker Hunter gets the same 30 millimeter Aidens, and even the Swift at tier 10 gets 30 millimeter Aidens. So once you get used to that lead and the way the guns behave, you're pretty much going to be all set up or going up into the tier 10 guns because the P228 is a great platform to learn that because you're going up against tier eights and tier nines. So it makes it a little bit more forgiving. Tier 10 matches, you better have your head on a swivel and have that lead locked in because you're not gonna get too many chances because a lot of those guys know what they're doing and they're gonna take advantage of it. So, Let's talk a little bit about history. The P228. How did this come about? Why does it not have a name? Why do all the other British aircraft get fun names like Typhoon, Tempest, Swift, Javelin, Hunter? Uh, this aircraft came about conceptually in 1946 by Gloucester. Uh, they must have gotten leaked information from the War Department or from the uh, Royal Air Force because the requirement to produce a jet that can do what this aircraft can do was established not until 1947. So it was kind of interesting to see that uh, they had already started developing in 1946. The requirement was for a fighter, twin engine night capable fighter that was able to go from on the ground to 45,000 feet within 10 minutes of lighting the burners. 
The goal being that they wanted to have aircraft that could intercept Russian bombers, jet-powered aircraft that would be bringing potentially nukes over to the island. So they wanted interceptors. And you can see that in the aircraft that they started developing when you start looking at the Tier 9 through 10 aircraft. The Hawker Hunter was on alert, always ready to do an intercept run. The Swift concept was built for the exact same reasons. In fact, the Seahawk was a competitor to the Hunter to do also the same purpose, to be an intercept platform sitting on alert, ready to go. And the P228 was the initial drawings and mock-ups that they started making in 1946 to meet this upcoming requirement. Now, the reason the P228 doesn't have a name is because it was just the first iteration. There was a P231, a P234, a P238, and each iteration kept changing things about the aircraft, the way the wings were shaped, uh, the way that the guns were mounted. And the funny thing is the P228 was the exact same project that culminated in the Javelin. I don't know about you guys, but this aircraft and this aircraft don't look that similar to me. But you know what two aircraft do look similar? The Meteor in the P228. I mean, even look at where the tailplane is oriented right here. So when we swap over the 228, somebody beefed it up. And that's exactly how they designed this platform. Gloucester designed the Meteor. They designed this aircraft. They essentially said, let's just take the Meteor and make it bigger and give it a second seat. Why did they give it a second seat? The second seat was to have a navigator, but really as a night capable intercept platform, what was the capability to, de to detect aircraft at night? It was very limited. They had very basic radars back then, but really you needed to have a sensor on the platform to be able to visually detect aircraft. What was the visual sensor? The Mark I eyeball. By putting a second person in the cockpit, you've doubled the sensors on board of the aircraft. One could focus on flying the plane, periodically looking for threats, while the nav could keep his head on a swivel and look for enemy aircraft. They also went so far as to follow the same design that was on the, the um, not the Hunter, the Hornet, the Tier 7 Heavy, where they mounted the guns underneath the nose because the Hornet was also used for doing night missions. And the problem that they would face is that the muzzle flash from the guns would kind of blind the pilot temporarily. So by putting the guns underneath, it removed a lot of the flash and prevented messing up their night vision uh, that they were kind of developing from being in that dark environment. I mean, we've all turned on a light in the middle of a dark room and just kind of been blinded for a second by the initial blast of light. Now imagine it being a cannon. So that would definitely be a big problem. So the P228 never really existed. It was some mock-ups. They did some drawings, but really this was just the first iteration that led to the Javelin. Kind of seems crazy to me. I mean, why would you go from guns mounted in the nose to guns mounted in the wing? Maybe it was for a more advanced radar sweep. That's my best guess. But the whole thing never really existed. Not in the way that we understand it as a production aircraft. But hopefully you guys enjoyed this video, learned a little bit about the development of this aircraft, as well as some ways that you can fly it to achieve better effects on the battlefield. And as always, I'll catch you on the next one.